In this lecture, we'll cover the costs and consequences of tsunami. Let's start with some basic facts about water. Moving water is incredibly powerful. Remember the speeds of water in the tsunami? The table shows how when the water is deep and the wavelength or period is long, the overall speed is fast, as fast as 586 miles per hour. As the water moves into shallower water, the wave slows down, but it's still going about 20 to 30 miles per hour, basically the speed of a car driving in town. Water at five or seven miles per hour is already very powerful, like a tornado. It's also important to note that the water doesn't have to be very deep to have an impact when it is traveling that fast. Also, people are slow, so it's very hard to outrun a tsunami. In some cases, it's better just to try to get up higher. A great way to get a sense of the power of a tsunami is to watch some videos of them. There's quite a lot of these on YouTube, and I posted one link to a video compilation from the 2004 tsunami, but just be aware that this might have some images that are disturbing. So what are the impacts of tsunamis? There are primary impacts of the water itself, the impact of the wave and flooding and erosion, and then there are also secondary consequences as well. First, let's look at some basic primary effects. This is in Thailand before the 2004 Sumatra tsunami. And this is after the tsunami. You can clearly see how much of the landscape was inundated just by the tsunami wave. Here's another example of an area struck by a wave based on a tsunami generated by a landslide in Latuya Bay, Alaska. This landslide occurred in 1958 and was triggered by a 7.7 .7 magnitude earthquake. Water surged up 1,720 feet. That's over the Sears Tower in Chicago and the waves swept out of the bay, stripping the shoreline of trees. I posted a link to a video simulation of what this might have looked like. Nobody was hurt in the tsunami. The parts that on land in those images that were inundated by the wave were in what is called the run-up zone. The run-up zone depends upon the height of the wave and the elevation of the land. Low-lying areas are more likely to become underwater than higher areas. When you watch some of the videos of tsunami damages, it's amazing to see how much damage is done in the run-up zone in 15 minutes to an hour. Here's an example from the 2011 Japan tsunami. The boat was dropped here as the water went out. You can also see that the lower parts of this building seem like they were hit, but the upper parts are okay. Other buildings did not fare as well. This is from Indonesia in September 2018 after the magnitude 7.3 earthquake. The water swept the car up and into this building. Here's another image from Japan in 2011. The house that is still standing, you can see the damage on the one side where the water hit. The main reason that the building is standing is that it is built on stilts, so to speak. So the bulk of the water goes under the building and it does not get swept off of its foundation like the other building did. Here's a bridge over a river that was destroyed in Palu in the 2018 Indonesia tsunami. The destruction of this bridge made rescue and humanitarian efforts much more difficult. In addition to the incredible amount of physical damage and the amount of water from tsunamis, in this image you can see a row of smoke and fire in the background. That is the harbor area. There was a huge fire in the harbor after the 2011 tsunami in Japan. Fires are one of the secondary effects of tsunami. They happen despite all the water because gas lines and fuel tanks can break. Another secondary effect is the impact on water quality and disease. The wave can contaminate water sources, bringing salty water, mud, debris, and chemicals like petroleum. The photos Banda Aceh after the 2004 Sumatran tsunami the poisoning of local water supplies by salt water was one of the major effects of that tsunami. Also, salty soils are bad for plants, and thousands of rice, mango, and banana plantations in Sri Lanka were destroyed in this tsunami. 
groundwater wells took almost two years to recover to be producing fresh water again. Lack of access to clean water can lead to inadequate sanitation. It may not be possible to boil drinking water to kill pathogens in the water, and that can further expose people to a range of waterborne diseases. A term specific to this natural disaster is tsunami lung. The chest radiographs here are from a 68-year-old woman who experienced a near drowning in the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011. She was admitted to the hospital seven hours after the experience. She had previously been healthy and at the time had good mental acuity and could walk herself. Eight hours later, after entering the hospital, she had a cardiac arrest. The chest x-rays show the spread of a fungus throughout her lungs that eventually also ended up attacking the rest of her body. She died on day 18, despite the intensive care provided, due to multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. Some tests were not conducted early on, either because she had previously been healthy or because of testing delays. The doctors published her case to warn others that antifungal agents should be considered for early treatment for all patients who have experienced near drowning in a tsunami. Other studies of tsunami lung from this event found that it was a very difficult condition to treat. How much did these tsunamis cost? It's hard to determine the true costs and deaths associated with tsunamis. But here are some estimates for some of the most recent large events that I've mentioned in this lecture. In these events, many thousands, and in some case millions of peoples of lives were affected. So what have we covered? The term runoff zone refers to the area that is directly damaged by a tsunami wave. Tsunami waves are very powerful and there's some unique features of their impacts. Certain types of buildings may be less likely to be damaged. Tsunami waves also have a wide range of secondary effects. <laughs>